Palmyra, a tropical island in the South Seas. For most of the year, it's uninhabited. But by strange coincidence, in June of 1974, six sailboats all converged on this tiny island. It should have been Shangri-La, but when bad blood developed, piracy took over, and the only law was the law of the jungle. small, uninhabited island, almost a thousand miles from nowhere. It's hard to believe such a paradise really exists. For most sailors on the South Pacific, Palmyra is a stop on the way to somewhere else. But for a few, it's a destination of its own, a place to disappear from the world. That's just what happened to Mac and Muff Graham, although it wasn't their intention. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Crime on the high seas falls under the jurisdiction of the FBI. The disappearance of the Grahams and their yacht suggested trouble in paradise. The problem was there was not a shred of evidence to prove it. Palmyra Atoll is a series of small islands in the South Pacific formed by a coral reef which surrounds a lagoon. It is owned by the United States and during World War II it housed a U.S. Navy base. The remains of the deserted base are still on the island today. It is located approximately 1,000 miles from Hawaii and is a stopover point for sailors and yachtsmen on their way to Samoa. Oftentimes, large, beautiful sailboats can be seen at the broken down docks in its lagoon. But on June 26, 1974, a small sailboat named the Iola made its way past the docks and into Palmyra's makeshift harbor. She had just completed a difficult 19-day journey from Hawaii, carrying a crew of two. The boat was not suitable for the trip, and now limped into the lagoon, barely seaworthy. The ship's motor had frozen up about halfway to Palmyra. Before leaving Hawaii, the owners had repaired the Iola, which was a wooden boat, by covering it with a coat of fiberglass. The friction created by these two materials caused a crack to form in the hull. On the way to Palmyra, the Iola had begun to take on water. They had little money and very few provisions. Their plan was to live off the fruits of the island until later in the year. They had made a deal with some friends to bring supplies to the island, which they would exchange for a crop of marijuana they intended to grow. When they arrived at Palmyra, they were unhappy to see a handful of visitors at the dock area. They had hoped they would have the island to themselves. When they came ashore, they were greeted by a welcoming committee. It wasn't at all what they had expected. They introduced themselves as Stephanie Stearns and Roy Allen, even though the name Buck was tattooed on his right arm in plain view. Oh, you got a you got Buck on your uh, on the side there. When one of the yachtsmen commented on it, Stephanie claimed that Buck was his nickname. Something about Roy was different from the other yachters. He seemed rougher, perhaps even a little dangerous. Shortly after Roy and Stephanie arrived, another boat appeared in the channel, a beautiful 38-foot catch called the Sea Wind. It wasn't long before the new arrivals made their way over to the dock. Mac Graham was 53 years old. His wife, Eleanor, nicknamed Muff, was a few years younger. 
Like Roy, they were surprised to find so many people on what was supposed to be an uninhabited island where they planned to spend the better part of a year. Hi, Stephanie. I'm Mac. Yeah. Hey, Mac, you got any, uh, any cigarettes? Sure. When Roy noticed Mac was a smoker, he asked for a cigarette and took most of the pack. This gesture would be considered impolite anywhere, but on an island, it was particularly so as supplies are limited and can't easily be replaced. For Mac and the others, this was their first insight into the kind of person Roy Allen might be. Roy also boasted about his plans to raise marijuana and trade it for supplies. Soon, everyone began settling into their new life in paradise. Mac Graham began to explore the island, the ruins of the Navy base and the sandy shores. CQ, CQ, CQDX. And he also made sure to keep yeah, in touch with the outside world by shortwave radio. Everything's fine out here. At regularly scheduled times, Mac would contact his friend Kurt Shoemaker in Hawaii and tell him about his latest discoveries. Here is KH6IHG, Hawaii Island, calling and listening. He was just like, you know, Tom Sawyer out in the, <laughs> on the Mississippi or something. And so um, he would explain what he did each day. You know, he'd go on excursions, just him with his machete through the jungle and exploring all the, you know, the things down there. For Roy and Stephanie, on the other hand, things weren't going quite as well. Roy found the island was not well suited for growing marijuana. Living aboard the Iola was difficult. The boat was small, damp, cluttered and cramped. Their supplies were all but gone, and they began to barter their possessions with the owners of the other boats for food and supplies. To the Grahams and the others, Roy and Stephanie were a nuisance. They were not properly supplied to be out on the high seas this far from civilization. The other yachters had enough supplies for themselves with some extra for emergencies, but not enough to supply Roy and Stephanie. The Grahams were known for their hospitality. They had invited the other visitors to Palmyra aboard the sea wing. Others warned them not to allow Roy and Stephanie on their boat. But Mac wanted to make an attempt at being cordial. On July 5th, two weeks after the Grahams arrived, and long after everyone else on the island had already had the tour of the sea wing, Roy and Stephanie received an invitation to visit. They eagerly accepted. Oh, the Sea Wind was a real yacht, you know. It was a, had, uh, it was a beautiful looking boat to begin with, and nice lines, and, and uh, Mac had uh, kept it in just perfect shape. The Sea Wind was everything the Iola was not. It had a fully stocked larder, and it was equipped with every high-tech navigational device on the market. It had plenty of room, and the sea wind had sailed around the world. Stephanie commented on its size and human comforts. She was enchanted by the big bunk in the forward cabin. Roy remained sullen. When Roy began to find the cramped quarters and damp bedding of the Iola too confining, he decided to move into a makeshift tent on the beach. Stephanie would stay aboard the boat. By now, Roy and Stephanie had bartered most of their possessions with the other yachts for food and supplies. Other than trading or flat-out begging, they had little to do with the others. The situation was getting worse by the day. Most of the marijuana seedlings they had counted on for money had been eaten by insects. Although Palmyra has abundant natural resources, including fish, crabs, bird eggs, and coconuts, Roy had little knowledge of how to survive off the land. To catch fish, he would shoot them with his 22 caliber revolver. Like clockwork, Mac continued his weekly radio conversations with Kurt, and he kept him informed about Roy and Stephanie. Okay. They had moved way down the end of the lagoon and would have nothing to do with the other group. And uh, bizarre things like they start planting marijuana again to see if they could grow it. 
uh, he he needed, uh, I think they were running low on food, so he needed coconuts. He took a chainsaw and co cut a coconut tree down to get to the coconuts. That's kind of stupid. It also infuriated hey, Mac Gray. Hey. Mac loved the island and had no tolerance hey, for fuck. Roy's destructive What's your ways. Problem? You don't have to do that to get one of these. Why don't you just climb up and get it down? One day he confronted Roy about it. I'd ask you Roy quickly anyway. became angry and told Mac to mind his own business. The hostility between them was built. On July 13th, Muff Graham wrote her mother a letter. She hadn't been enthusiastic about living on an island in the first place, and having Roy and Stephanie there only added to her misgivings. Dearest mother, three boats are here now, but one is leaving and will take this letter with them. That leaves us alone with the hippie couple who plan to stay here and live off the land. It's just our luck they decided to roost in Palmyra. Roy and Stephanie have run out of sugar, cigarettes, and I don't know what. They've bartered with other boats. Next, they will ask us. Muff sent the letter back to civilization with Bernard and Evelyn Leonard, who were leaving Palmyra after a brief stay. The Grahams had previously made arrangements to receive letters over the radio from Kurt Schumacher, who read them to Mac during their regular weekly shortwave contacts. During that period of time, I was receiving mail from both of their mothers, his mother and her. And um, they would, then I would read this to them. Well, as one of the boats down there would leave, they would take the mail with them and eventually mail it when back in Honolulu or wherever. So there was communication going back and forth. And an interesting thing about it is uh, one of the letters I read, uh, the mother, and I think she was in her 80s, she says uh, that she was afraid for them. She says, you should leave that place. Something will happen to you. One day when Mac was talking to Kurt, he told him that Roy had sent a message with one of the yachts back to his friends in Hawaii. They were supposed to bring Roy and Stephanie supplies to Palmyra, and he told his friends to reply through Kurt's shortwave radio. Mac asked him if he had heard any news from them. But Kurt had heard nothing, and when Mac talked to him about Roy and Stephanie, there was something about their description that worried him. Then in between these conversations, he had occasionally mentioned the, the other boat. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, that doesn't sound too good to these people. I said, you know, you better be careful. And he said, well, he said, no, I can take care of myself. I'll be all right. And, uh, so I said, well, I don't know. I think you ought to get out of there myself, or one of you ought to leave. I don't want to hear it. No, I don't, I don't care. Roy and Stephanie's tempers were running dump, short. That's why. Look around you. During the first no, weeks no, of August, know. the sound of angry voices could frequently be heard across the lagoon. No, I don't want to hear the other visitors to the island saw Roy as a violent and quick-tempered man who was dangerous and should be avoided. Then, midway through August, another boat came to Palmyra and spent a few days. Norman Sanders and Thomas Wolfe were on their way to Samoa. The night before they were set to leave, they had cocktails with Mac and Muff. The talk turned to the Iola. Sanders was a sailing expert. He told them he had offered Roy advice about getting the Iola to Samoa. He said he'd suggested Roy and Stephanie should go there, but Roy had just become angry and refused the help. Wolf cautioned the Grahams that it would be easy for an unsuspecting couple to disappear in a place like Palmyra. In response, Mac opened a drawer and pulled out a 357 Magnum. He assured the others that he could take care of himself. I'm tougher than he is, Mac said confidently. Wolf and Sanders left Palmyra the next day. The, um, the group of people that were down there, the various boats, um, one by one, of course, were on their way somewhere, and they, one after another, left. Visitors had come and gone pretty regularly for the last two months. But with the departure of Wolf and Sanders on August 17th, things changed. This was the end of the season when most sailors would be stopping by Palmyra. Mac and Muff Graham were alone on the island with Stephanie and Roy.
On August 27th, Mac talked to Kurt Shoemaker. Roy and Stephanie and the Grahams had been alone on Palmyra for 10 days. The tension between Mac and Muff Graham and Roy and Stephanie had increased. Muff knew Roy had a gun and a chainsaw, and at one point he'd been seen with an acetylene torch. This scared her and she wanted off Palmyra, but Mac stubbornly didn't want to leave. The boats had moved to opposite sides of the lagoon and the couples pretty much ignored each other. But then, something unusual happened. Here is KH6IHG. I was talking to him, and while we're talking, he hears a, a female voice yelling, saying, saying, you know, calling to him. And uh, he says, oh, what's this company? So he says, hang on a minute, I'll go topside and see. And he says, I'll be darned. She's coming over in her dinghy, and she says she has a cake for him. And he says, uh, I guess they're going to declare a truce or something. Huh? That was the, term, the words he used. He says, I better check this out carefully. I said, OK. So same schedule next week, same time. So I said, be careful now. And you. See you later. Thank was it? Thank you. Thank you. One week later, Shoemaker was at his radio for their regularly scheduled conversation. For the first time since Mac and Muff had left Hawaii, there was no response from the sea wind. I was concerned about that, and uh, I tried for quite a while, about 20 minutes, a half an hour, trying to make contact. So the next contact was a couple of days later, and then I tried again, nothing. And then uh, for the next few weeks, I, I tried, you know, in intermittently from time to time. And then it was at that point that I decided something happened. Unable to convince the authorities that something had gone wrong on Palmyra, Shoemaker had a friend fly over the island. The aerial survey seemed to confirm his worst fears. Palmyra was deserted. There were no boats in the harbor, no Iowa, no sea wind, and there was no sign of life. Well, I had a feeling that, uh, all that time that uh, something had happened. The, the boat had been taken over. I, I was very strong feelings about that, simply because of the, all of the incidents that they related to me and he related and I mean it just pointed to that one thing but I couldn't convince anyone that that was a problem. Shoemaker did have one resource available to him, the radio. Having no idea where they had gone, he spread the word to yachtsmen in the Pacific to be on the lookout for the sea wind. The days, weeks, and then months passed with no word about the fate of Mac and Muff Graham or the sea wind. Two months after the last communication with the Grahams, Bernard and Evelyn Leonard, who had been given the last written message from the Grahams, were at the Alawai Yacht Harbor in Hawaii. Bernard noticed a 38-foot catch with very distinctive lines. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It had been repainted, but Bernard was certain it was the sea wind. He also recognized a familiar figure on deck, Roy Allen. Knowing the tensions that had existed between the Grahams and Roy and Stephanie, and also knowing that the Grahams had not been heard from in some time, Leonard immediately called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard had been aware of the missing sea wind. When Leonard explained that the owners were not on the boat, the Coast Guard officers felt this might lead to something outside of their jurisdiction. They called the FBI. The call was answered by Special Agent Calvin Shishido, who worked out of the FBI's Hawaii field office. My assignment there was uh, just a general mix of general criminal investigations, security investigations, backgrounds. Uh, it, it was such a small office that we couldn't specialize. We had to handle everything that came at us. Shishido agreed to meet the Coast Guard and the Leonards at the marina, although what he heard was not conclusive enough to warrant FBI involvement. Perhaps the owners were on shore, or perhaps they had sold the boat. Perhaps it wasn't even the sea wind. After arriving moments later, the Leonards showed him the yacht in question. There seemed to be no one aboard. So he pointed out the uh, uh, areas where there was an attempt to disguise the boat. You know, it had been repainted. The gunnels had been repainted. The, uh, uh, the uh, nameplate was taken off. It was removed and painted over. 
um, and other things that he pointed out to show that it was actually the sea wind. He knew it was the sea wind. Although there was still no direct evidence of foul play, Shishida was growing suspicious. There was no visible activity on the boat, so Shishido instructed the Coast Guard officers to post a lookout. The lookout spotted Roy and Stephanie the next morning, rowing from the floating dock towards shore in a little dinghy. He immediately alerted the Coast Guard, who in turn called Special Agent Shishido. But another boat owner hailed Stephanie and Roy and told them that the Coast Guard had been looking around their boat the day before. Roy noticed a Coast Guard patrol boat in the marina that seemed to be moving towards them. Roy quickly changed direction and headed for the nearest dock. After letting Roy off, Stephanie started to row back to the sea wind. plainclothes policemen were approaching Roy when he spotted them. Without hesitating, he turned and dove off the end of the dock and began to swim away. The officers found a wallet on the dock. And in it was the identification of this Roy Allen, and it had a photograph. And uh, I believe Mr. Leonard found, uh, looked at the picture and said, that was Roy Allen. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard boat had spotted Stephanie in the rowboat and began to give chase. She turned and started to row towards shore, hoping to reach the dock before they caught up with her. When she reached the dock, she jumped out and began to run but there was nowhere for her to go. The patrol boat was right behind, with Bernard Leonard aboard. He and a Coast Guardsman followed him. saw her dart into a hotel stairwell. They found her hiding behind a potted palm. She immediately recognized Leonard from Palmyra. Come with us. As the Coast Guard officer took her into custody, one question was foremost on Leonard's mind. What had happened to the Grahams? Stephanie Stearns was taken to the Coast Guard offices for questioning. On the way there, Bernard, Leonard, and Stephanie found themselves alone in the rowboat. When he asked if Mac and Muff were still alive, she shook her head. Mac and Muff, she told him, had apparently drowned. At least, they never found their bodies. Leonard was incredulous. How could that have happened? Stephanie explained that she and Roy had been invited to the Sea Wind for dinner, but the Grahams never showed up. The next morning, she and Roy found the Grahams' overturned inflatable Zodiac boat washed up on shore in the shark-infested lagoon. After searching fruitlessly for the bodies, they decided to take their own boat back to Hawaii. But it got hung up on the reef, so they went back and took the abandoned sea wind. Leonard listened to Stephanie, but he didn't believe her story. I remember it. I was In the Coast Guard offices, she started telling her story again, this time to Special Agent Shishido in the Coast Guard. Okay. This is the way it happened. This is the way I'm, I'm telling it to you. Details then of what happened to them. At one point, I remember speaking to her. She kept going on and on, and I kept reminding her that she had the right to remain silent and that anything she said could be used against her in a court of law. And she would just keep on talking. 
Stephanie told him she had arrived at the Sea Wind with Roy just about in time for dinner. The boat was strangely quiet. They called out, but no one answered. Hello? Hello? They went below and continued their search, but got no reply. I can't find anybody down here. They're not here. Didn't she say they were going to meet us here? Yeah, they, they knew we were coming for dinner. They assumed the Grahams had gone out fishing for dinner and made themselves at home till they returned. There's nobody here. According to Stephanie, the Grahams never showed up, so they both decided to spend the night on the sea wind. All right. They believed the Grahams would show up any time. But the next morning, when the Grahams hadn't returned, she said they became very worried and went out to look for Muff and Mac as soon as it was light. But all they found was the Grahams' overturned Zodiac washed up on shore and a can full of gasoline. They turned the inflated boat over and started the motor. Then she said they spent the next two days searching for the Grahams or any sign of what might have happened to them. But they found nothing. The Grahams had simply vanished. Shishido found her story implausible. Together, and we went over there. When she explained how they had taken possession of the sea wind, her story was quite different from the one she had just told Leonard. No one would have believed us. They would have taken this the time, boat. she said they had left Palmyra aboard the Sea Wind, towing the Iola, which got caught up on a reef and sank. And all we found Stephanie was, was tripping over her first lie. And but I knew there were at least, you know, two conflicting stories as to how they got in possession of the boat. At this point, we became very um, uh, worried about the Graham's condition. We didn't know what had happened to them, and we certainly was, you know, was not going to get any uh, real true information from Stephanie Stern. But the FBI has jurisdiction over crime on the high seas. Shishido determined he had enough evidence to arrest Stephanie Stearns for interstate transportation of stolen property. Then his attention turned to Stephanie's boyfriend, Roy Allen, who had evaded the police at the marina and was still at large. Shishido checked and there was no record of a Roy Allen, but he had the wallet with Roy Allen's picture. Bernard Leonard also told Shishido that Roy had taken marijuana plants to Palmyra and had intended to grow them to sell them. Drugs and a photograph of Roy gave him a starting place. But I suspected that people with, you know, traveling on the Iola, which is not really a seaworthy boat, going around and planting marijuana on the islands and so on, must be involved in drug running. Hi, Cal, how are you? Pretty good, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. What can I do for you today? Uh, Shishido okay. took the photograph to the Drug uh, Enforcement water, Agency you know? and showed it to several of the agents. They were surprised well, we when they looked at the picture. Our... Let me get into it. They told him that it was Buck Walker and that they had okay. been looking for him. I'll get back to you on that. Have a good day. Same to you. All right. Thank you. And so we got all the background data on Buck Walker, and that's when our search for Buck Walker began. And uh, that now we're looking for Buck Walker instead of Roy Allen. Buck Dwayne Walker was a convicted felon and a fugitive. He'd been awaiting sentencing on a drug conviction when he and Stephanie fled Hawaii on the Iola headed for Palmyra. As the search for Walker began with a new urgency, Shishida was also concerned about the Grahams. He knew Stephanie was lying and changing details about what had happened on Palmyra. He didn't trust her story about the fate of the Grahams. There was always the possibility that the Grahams were alive and stranded on the island. Shishido made arrangements for himself and some other agents to travel to Palmyra to see if they could find them. We decided to go to Palmyra to see if maybe the Grahams were, were stranded there, you know, in need of food, and, uh, or they could have been tied up for all we know, and, you know, immobile, and uh, their lives were in danger. So we decided to go out there to look around, and, and we did. On the island, they found the remains of the camp Buck Walker had abandoned. They took photographs and examined the site thoroughly. 
A search of the island produced no sign of the Grahams. However, Shishido did make a couple of curious discoveries. I remember picking up a hatch cover, and of course, later it was identified as a hatch cover coming off of the Iola. The hatch cover was important because no seaman would leave for high waters without his hatch cover. Without it, the boat could take on water, which would cause it to sink. This told Shishido that Roy and Stephanie had intended to scuttle the Iola. Using these clues, Shishido began to develop his theory as to what happened to the Grahams. My thinking was that they had tied the couple up and put them on the Iola and sank the Iola. And that was the only explanation we had because we couldn't find the Iola and there was no way the Iola could be in Hawaii because they certainly wouldn't be uh, sailing the sea wind and the Iola by themselves. Shishido found something at an old Navy warehouse that piqued his interest. I think one of the things, too, that I noticed was that in an old workshop or warehouse, there was an old uh, air rescue boat or sea rescue boat, and it had a uh, place for three containers where they put provisions. And of the three, two uh, receptacle areas were, you know, the cans were missing, and the third was still left there. And of course, now we're looking for two people. In my mind, you know, suspiciously, suspiciously thought that these two cans, because you know, it was large enough that they could have been, you know, containing the remains of the uh, couple. Meanwhile, the search for Buck Walker continued. On November 8th, 1974, after spending 10 days hiding out on the lava flows on the big island of Hawaii, Buck resurfaced in a tiny hamlet off the beaten track. He rented a room and went to a restaurant for a drink. Gentlemen, At the same moment across the street, two uniformed officers were leaving lunch. As they paid the bill, they showed their waitress a picture of Buck Walker. She said he'd just been in the restaurant looking for a drink, and she'd sent him to a bar across the street. The officers spotted him and contacted the FBI. Buck was arrested on a fugitive charge. He was read his rights and handcuffed without a struggle. FBI, you're under arrest. Put your under hands questioning, up. Buck revealed nothing that could help the investigation. He answered questions with a frank yes or no, or with stone silence. The investigators couldn't find even the slightest piece of information that could help them find the Grahams. While Stephanie was in prison awaiting trial, Shishido found more proof Stephanie and Buck were lying. While she was at prison, uh, we found out that she had some photographs developed. So when the photographs were developed and brought back to prison, we seized the photographs and examined them. Among the photographs showed that the sea wind, or Stephanie Stearns was on the sea wind taking a photograph of the Iola on the full sail with Buck Walker on board the Iola. So we knew that at one point, Stephanie was on the sea wind and Buck Walker by himself on the Iola. This right, was different go. than the stories both Buck and Stephanie told officials. Shishida was convinced that the Grahams had been murdered. But without any bodies and no hard evidence, the U.S. attorney assigned to prosecute the case did not believe they could make a homicide charge stand up in court. We could, but it's strictly circumstantial, and we might not win the case. And if we lose the case, and later, you know, years later, if the body should pop up and we get some real good evidence as to murder on the part of the, the Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns, he, he said we couldn't try them again. So I thought, well, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns were charged with interstate transportation of stolen property. It was an open and shut case. Buck and Stephanie had been caught with possession of the sea wind in Hawaii and had made numerous attempts to change its appearance. Buck had registered it under his name as a homemade boat. Buck and Stephanie were both found guilty. Buck Walker received 10 years for his previous drug conviction and five years for theft of the sea wind. 
Stephanie Stearns received two years for her role in the boat theft. But Shishida was still convinced the couple had killed Mac and Muff Graham, and that somewhere on or around Palmyra was the evidence to prove it. He could only hope that someday it might surface, and then he could charge Buck and Stephanie with murder. On January 21st, 1981, a young South African couple, Robert and Sharon Jordan, were visiting Palmyra. Almost seven years had passed since Mac and Muff Graham disappeared. That afternoon, Sharon went for a walk down the beach and made a startling discovery. Washed up on the shore was an aluminum canister, and beside it, she found human bones and a skull. Around one of the bones was a wristwatch. She had heard the story of Mac and Muff Graham and immediately contacted the Coast Guard. Cal Shishida was catching up on paperwork when he overheard part of a phone conversation. First he heard the words human bones, and then Palmyra. Where's Palmyra? The agent was new and had never heard of the case. Shishida was on his feet immediately. Who was on the phone, he asked. The agent told him it was the Coast Guard. Shishido quickly took the phone and told the Coast Guard to ask the couple who had discovered the bones to stay on the island and wait for them. When I first heard that, of course, I was really excited because I thought, whoa, somebody found some bones on Palmyra and it had to be the Grams. And I thought, this is it. Shishido and a team of investigators flew to Palmyra to examine the new findings. If the bones Sharon Jordan found belonged to either one of the Grahams, the FBI might be able to establish the cause of death. Shishido was shown the gruesome discovery. A skull, human bones, a wristwatch, and some wire, all lying next to an open metal box, identical to the kind Shishido noticed in the rescue boats on his previous visit to the island. He speculated that the wire had been wrapped around the case and had somehow come loose. Then when the case came ashore, it had opened and the bones had spilled out. Since a second container had been missing from the Navy rescue boat, Shishido felt the other victim might still be inside. Divers were sent to search the surrounding waters, looking for a container like the one found on the beach. But in the shark-infested waters, the divers found nothing. When Shishido got back to Honolulu, he sent the container, wire, skull and bones to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. for examination. The skull belonged to a Caucasian woman in her late 40s or early 50s. Dental records showed that it was Muff Graham's. The skull also had signs of charring around the left eye socket and a hole in the left temple. The FBI concluded that the contour of the hole was consistent with a gunshot wound, but due to the age of the wound, could not say conclusively that it was caused by a bullet. The aluminum box was examined by the FBI Elemental Analysis Unit. They found evidence of charring on the outside of the box. Next, the FBI needed to determine if the skeleton had been in the box. They cut out a rectangular section and subjected it to a battery of tests. The rectangular piece of metal was found to contain traces of human protein, conclusive proof that the box had once held a body. The FBI did a, did a tremendous job uh, as far as the container was concerned because they came back with a report that indicated that there were human remains in the container, that the remains had been burned, and that while it was in flame, the container was in about two inches of water. And they found uh, traces of human protein, uh, human fabric in the container and everything uh, to indicate that a human body was disposed of in the container by flame. 
As Shishido had suspected, Muff Graham had not simply drowned. She had been murdered. The FBI now believed it had enough evidence to prosecute Buck and Stephanie for the murder of Muff Graham. Having served her jail term for the theft of the Sea Wind, Stephanie now had a white collar job in California. She was arrested and taken into custody. Buck Walker was still serving time in prison, or so Shishido thought. When I sent uh, our agents in uh, the state of Washington uh, a lead to put a detainer on Buck Walker, I found out that he was an escapee. And so I thought, oh no, not again. You know, are we gonna have to do this search all over for him? We found that there was only one woman that had visited him and that she had visited him the day before his escape. A trace was placed on the woman which led them to her car, parked in a motel in Yuma, Nevada. The FBI was notified and set up a stakeout. When Buck and another man came out of the motel and approached the car, the FBI moved in. He was considered an armed and dangerous fugitive, wanted both for murder and jail. front seat of the car, they found barbiturates and several thousands of dollars in cash. Buck Walker was arrested and charged with the murder of Muff Graham. Stephanie Stearns was also arrested and charged with the same crime, though they would be tried separately. Because of the publicity the story had generated in Hawaii, the trials were moved to San Francisco. Both cases were assigned to federal prosecutor Elliot Inoki. The motive for the crime was never in doubt. The motive was they were um, without a seaworthy vessel. Uh, the only other couple on the island was leaving shortly. They were running out of food and they didn't know when any other uh, vessel would get there, if at all, because this was be becoming the end of the so-called season when you could expect uh, people to visit the island. So you had people running out of food uh, and provisions with an inability to get anywhere. Enoki knew he could show Buck and Stephanie had opportunity and motive to kill the Grahams. But first he had to prove in court that Muff Graham was murdered. He also needed to completely discredit Buck and Stephanie's story that the Grahams had drowned. As Inoki began constructing his theory of the case, Shishida was busy putting holes in Buck and Stephanie's defense. The FBI had already found evidence of human protein on the sides of the aluminum box, but since the bones were found next to it, Inoki wanted additional proof that the body had actually been in the box therefore ruling out the possibility of Muff drowning as Buck and Stephanie had claimed. He contacted San Francisco's chief medical examiner, Boyd Stevens. Finding the skeleton together is supportive that Miss uh, Graham was in that box and therefore held together. It's not possible for me to really say that she couldn't have stayed together if she had been out of the box. However, the problems that would re be required is that um, the skeleton has to stay together even after it's disarticulated. And that's an extremely strong argument that that could not have occurred if she had died and just been laying on the lagoon bottom. The second is that the skeleton has to come ashore together, and, and that's just not really possible. Shishido also decided to test Buck and Stephanie's story that the Graham's dinghy the Zodiac had been found overturned. Uh, of course, you know, a later investigation showed that if the boat had capsized the way she, they, they said she, they found it, the, the outboard motor would have been inoperable because of the salt water going into the engine itself. Um, and of course, we made a test to find out whether the Zodiac could actually tip over accidentally, and we tried to force it to turn upside down, banging into things with, you know, with three or four men sitting on one edge of the boat, and it just wouldn't tip over. Inoki also asked medical examiner Boyd Stevens to examine Muff Graham's skull in order to corroborate the FBI's findings that Muff had been murdered. 
Inoki knew that having two highly respected sources would strengthen his case. Stevens found flat abrasions to the skull, consistent with prolonged confinement in a box, such as the aluminum container. The uh, key issues for us was the flattening of the skull, which represents that it had been placed against a hard, flat surface, primarily across the left side of the face. And what I'm pointing to is the nose, the eye sockets, and what would be the cheek and life, and of course the teeth. One of the things that was evident about the skull of Miss Graham is that this whole area about the face had been planed down so that it was a flat surface. And if you can imagine, if I take this skull and put it across a flat surface, and let's just say this table is coated with sandpaper, and I work it back and forth for a period of time, eventually I would shave it down till it was a flat surface. There was a second plane showing that the skull had changed position and again had been exposed to a flat surface with motion for a long period of time. We used that as an argument that the skull had been within the box and, and moving. If the body had been buried in the coral sand, then it would not be a, a change that we would expect to see. And coffin uh, wear is not seen if somebody's buried in dirt or in coral. It's seen if they're in a, a hard surface container. There were minimal animal bite marks and insects on the skull, which were consistent with remains that had only been exposed to the surface life for a short period of time, presumably the time after the box had surfaced and opened. But what about the charring on the skull in the metal box? Did this show an attempt to destroy the body? Uh, one of the questions we had been asked is whether we could prove that the skull had been burned with an acetylene torch. People who were at Palmyra when Buck and Stephanie were there saw Buck with an acetylene torch. The FBI believed this is what caused the burns to the skull. If Inoki could have Stevens corroborate this, he could further implicate Walker. If a person is exposed to a flame, uh, there may be burning of the outer portions of the skin, but until the water is evaporated, the tissue can't burn and it takes a heat period to boil the water off or evaporate it before the tissue can actually burn. Uh, acetylene torches, of course, run fairly hot and they would do that uh, process fairly rapidly. The marks on the skull clearly showed the use of an extreme source of heat. Further evidence that Muff had been murdered. The forensic evidence overwhelmingly proved that Muff Graham had been murdered. A trial date was set. A trial involving people who live on the high seas presents some unique challenges. The FBI had to subpoena about 40 witnesses and then make sure they were in San Francisco at the time of the trial. Special Agent Hal Marshall was assigned to the case. I first became involved uh, when I transferred to Honolulu in 1981 from uh, Los Angeles. Witnesses were flying in from all over the world, literally. Sharon Jordan and her husband and two children came in twice from South Africa. And one of the hard situations was they were, a lot of these people were boating people who did not keep in touch. Uh, last we heard of some of them, they were in a bay in Hawaii in a boat with no fixed address. So it was a matter of getting them to San Francisco, sometimes having to wait two or three days, sometimes postponing it, uh, weather conditions and things like that that required us to, to be sure they were there when we needed them. And luckily, uh, everybody showed up that, that needed to show up and everything went smooth. There were only two possible suspects, and Buck had an extensive criminal record. But did Buck commit the murder alone, or was Stephanie also involved? She was the last person known to have contact with the Grahams on the day she brought them a cake. Elliot and Oki believed Stephanie had one strong advantage on her side. Well, um, she had one option. She could blame Walker. And uh, although she didn't directly do that, her attorney certainly did in the way the case was argued and presented. Um, so um, uh, that gave her a very big option that Walker simply did not have, or if he had, it was a much more difficult sell 
because of the circumstances and the personalities involved. Um, uh, he's the one with the prior record, uh, much bigger than, than she is. Um, you know, the testimony about him shooting fish with his gun. I mean, it, he had a lot of things on his side of the ledger that were not on her side of the ledger. One of the other substantial differences uh, is that Stephanie testified in the case, uh, Walker did not, and so she directly refuted any claim of knowledge or involvement in, in, in any kind of homicide. Um, but certainly, um, get, through her testimony, left uh, a large room for her attorney to argue that Mr. Walker had the uh, opportunity and the means to commit a murder. A jury found Buck Walker guilty after only a few hours of deliberations, and he received a sentence of life in prison. Stephanie Stearns was defended by famed attorney Vincent Bugliosi, who was convinced of her innocence. She was acquitted of all charges when he convinced a jury that Buck not only acted alone, but sought to conceal the crime from his girlfriend. We may never know what really happened on Palmyra on that day in late August, so the forensic evidence paints a grisly picture. Well, empirically, I believe that uh, that Miss Graham was killed exactly as the uh, charge was uh, uh, made. That is, that she was shot. That uh, there was an attempt to burn her body. That her extremities were probably fractured to get her into the box, and that she was cast into the ocean and then eventually came adrift. And I think that that probably happened to the husband as well. Matt Graham's body has never been found, although investigators believe there's a very high likelihood that he's in the other box.